to make this event come together to become success. I would like to salute our patrons, Chancellor Dr. J. Ramachandran sir and Pro Chancellor Dr. Rajesh Ramachandran sir for their kindness and care towards the staff. I cordially welcome our Vice Chancellor, Colonel Dr. G. Trivasaran sir, the man of inspiration for all the things. My humble welcome to our beloved register, Dr. P.M. J. Prakashwil sir, for his constant support, encouragement, and the man behind the show. It's my great honor to welcome the guest speaker of this webinar, Dr. P.M. J. Dr. Richard Samuel sir, for his senior scientist, CMR, Conservation of Coastal and Marine Resource Division, National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management. NCSCM, in short, and I, for joining with us to grace the occasion today. He is a family to our department. He is more or like as our family member. My warm welcome to our collaborator of this event, Dr. Darwin Anadrai, founder and managing trustee, Eco Society India, Chennai, for getting us the wonderful speaker and acted as a jury member for the art contest. Yes, today we are having two events. After the felicitation address, we will display the artworks submitted by the students under two themes. In this regard, Dr. Darwin sir and our beloved professor, Dr. K. Althar sir, act as jury members. Thank you for both of you, sir. I also extend my hearty welcome to the most respected general registrar, controller of examination, deans, heads, and directors. A warm welcome to you all. My cheerful welcome to the participants, colleagues, and my dear friends. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time. Our eminent professor, Dr. K. Althar, sir, will speak more about the webinar theme. Let's learn together. Thank you, one and all, giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now invite our eminent and beloved professor, Dr. K. Althar, sir, from Department of Marine Biotechnology to deliver the theme address. Over to you, sir. Oh, good morning to all of you. I have the pleasure of uh, just sharing some of my thoughts on the environment on this auspicious day. It is uh, something which uh, every human being need to think deeply about uh, what kind of variations that has been taking place on the environment. So the Mother Earth is uh, one of the planets uh, in the cosmic uh, realm. And uh, the kind of variation or changes that has been witnessed for the past uh, two, three decades are not, uh, not uh, something which uh, we desire. It is, it is something which is uh, going highly adverse to the environment. Being a generic and species human being are the most uh, intelligent uh, organism inhabiting this uh, planet. But due to our anthropogenic activity, we sometimes feel that, the naturalists feel that we are trying to go adverse to ourselves. So it is mainly because there is quite a lot of uh, unwanted things happening around the world. It is uh, when we talk about the environment, it is not really restricted to the India or any other subcontinent or continent. It is all over the world. There is quite a lot of uh, disturbances. Uh, and uh, these uh, disturbances are sometimes uh, alarming. We do not know what is going to happen in the next uh, uh, decade or in another half a century. We believe that there is uh, coexistence on Earth by every individual species. Every species, either it is animal, plant, or microbial. It has got its own place on Earth. But sometimes we feel that all these uh, creatures or the minor organisms, but they are not minor. They are major and play a major role in 
sustaining the attributes of this planet but we never think about destroying them when we establish a house or a industry when we want something to be done we indiscriminately we try to damage the environment maybe for promoting the real estate or constructing a dam for our convenience trying a forest for our uh, uh, building materials or any such thing so all these activities now brought us to a state where there is impact of all this destruction in the form of uh, climatic change and this climatic change is mostly uh, reflected in the form of elevation of temperature and uh, uh, liquidification of the icebergs and as a result you know that the world has got or the oceanography says there is a great conveyor belt which circulates the water from arctic to the tropical and tropical to the arctic so this circulation keeps the earth in the normal climatic condition our interferences now make things much uh, different or much worse as a result there is a possibility of even elevated much more elevated temperature and we may think uh, what is hap- going to happen to human being we are quite comfortable with our acs or with our heaters in the changing environment but please think about the minute creatures and they do have a kind of a, a threshold for the temperature this threshold suppose if a insect which is performing quite a lot of work in degradation of the fecal matter or any such thing if its uh, maximum temperature tolerance is 32 degrees centigrade even 33 degree centigrade is fatal to that the entire species may be lost from the environment likewise there are many key species and this uh, keynote species if we lose then there will be mass destruction of the environment we we should try to realize this in this way we are just uh, trying to tamper the environment thinking that it is give, giving to be a more uh, healthy and more prosperous life for us but in fact it, it is going to backfire so we may not be uh, in a position to enjoy the attributes because we are indirectly destructing these attributes second aspect is pollution and this pollution is uh, of various type heavy metals industrial effluent domestic sewage or uh, plastic pollution or uh, green gas pollution this uh, again the whole world is there are quite a lot of uh, discussions and activities are going on but uh, what exactly is the end result we need to analyze these things uh, deeply and here i would like to tell another aspect there has been many egoistic attitude by the world leaders themselves so this is another type of pollution if you say environmental pollution through materialistic aspects and this is mental pollution and this mental pollution also is equal and e- equally detrimental because because of the egoistic attitudes country to country may fight there may be quite a lot of uh, battles this and that and also a a a kind of uh, happening which is undesirable so we need to take care of the 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 mental pollution environmental pollution and environmental protection so this environmental protection is not only the job of environmentalist it is job of every citizen every living human being on earth unless we protect it i i i, I am very sure that in next uh, three four decades if we want to give any kind of indication how it was all those indications may have been may, may be 
eradicated or erased. Now let us think about our next progeny, next generation, and try to save this earth for themselves also. We enjoy it. What, we, what people enjoyed some 30, 40 years back, now the children are not enjoying such uh, greeneries and beauties. But let us at least now make a kind of uh, oath or we take uh, some kind of promise that I am not uh, uh, we involved in destruction of the environment. As a result, we can try to replenish the plant more trees, try to find out alternative ways for converting the waste to something uh, useful. In that way, we can initiate, every individual need to initiate and this is uh, a day on which we should try to think more and more about the environment. And we have a very eminent person who is uh, uh, something uh, uh, very deeply knowledge with regard to our coastal system. And this coastal system, India is blessed with such a vast coastal system, whereby we can have a, a kind of large amount of, uh, of protein at a cheaper rate we can produce and uh, because of some pollution or any such thing now things are not going on very well but if we again preserve our uh, coastal regions and try to promote some sustainable activity definitely there won't be any dearth for the food security and so with this i would like to in, uh, invite the speaker and uh, welcome you sir and we are eagerly waiting for your lecture thank you thank you sir no, it's my privilege to introduce our guest dr deepak samuel a scientist from national center for sustainable coastal management chennai dr samuel has done his phd from sdmri to in 2004 from 2005 to 2007, he worked as assistant professor in Ministry of Education, Africa. From 2007 to 10, he worked in Madras Christian College as assistant professor. After that, he worked as program specialist in United Nations Development Program, Gulf of Manar Project. He also worked as scientist in the National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management, Chennai. Dr. Samuel has been honored as Young Scientist Award for the best paper presentation in 2001. He has also received many best research paper award in many national and international conferences. Dr. Samuel has been honored with Green Crusader Award for contribution towards conservation of environment in Tirchi. Dr. Samuel has completed more than 10 research project, projects and published more than 70 research articles in peer-reviewed journals. With this short intro introduction, now I would like to invite Dr. Deepak Samuel, sir, to deliver the talk. I welcome you, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much. I wish I'm audible. I uh, just yes, need sir. a... Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege for me to be a part of... Uh, international celebration with Amit University. Amit University is like my second home. You know, I have been uh, associated with Amit University right from way back 2006 seven. Uh, I want to thank very specially for uh, inviting me, Dr. Sendil, you know, and also Mr. Darwin. Uh, you know, we, Darwin also works a lot on the coastal systems and he's got a very active uh, a CBO. I won't call it as an NGO because it's a more on conservation based. I will probably give a rank of the CBO to uh, Darwin's uh, work. And uh, I am also able to see uh, uh, our uh, Professor Karim Altaf, whom I've met many times. Thank you for the wonderful words that have set the platform for us today. And uh, I'm also able to see Jay Prakash Vail, my very good friend. And uh, also Maya Kannan, who I met some time back. I'm just trying to recognize all the faces I am able to see here. And I hope uh, Mutharin also is there, another uh, junior and a good friend of mine. And uh, it's good to be back with you all. And uh, I will straight away start my presentation without uh, wasting much of a time. Now, how much time do I have? Dr. Sendhil, if you can let me know how much time I have, then probably I can. Yes, I will. 
<laughs> okay, that's very kind of you. It's a very, very broad subject. And, uh, you know, as uh, uh, explained to me uh, by Darwin uh, in consultation of the Sendal, I come to know that uh, you wanted to focus on seagrass. And uh, seagrass is also very close to my heart because when I started my research, I worked on transplantation of uh, seagrass and corals in the Gulf of Manar. In my uh, initial days of PhD, that was not my major PhD work, but still I was involved in the other projects. So that gave me a lot of experience uh, about these beautiful underwater flowering meadows. So let me not waste more time. I will just start my presentation. Yes, sir. You just have to let me know whether I'm able to, uh, you're able to see the presentation. Can you? Yes, sir. The screen is sharing now. Yeah, yeah, it I might take slides. Great, okay. Fine. So my first slide here explains to all of us, including me, that from 2021 to 2030, the United Nations has declared it as the ecosystem restoration decade. 10 years of restoration work is going to be the prime focus as part of the all parties to the United Nations Convention, which took place way back in Rio de Janeiro. So this actually is an extension of the initial SDG goals set way back in uh, 2010, that by 2020, every partner to this particular convention will have its own countries, protected areas, conserved areas, more than 10% under its kitty, so that there are natural systems available to sustain wildlife and sustain the environment and sustain livelihood. Having said that, this is the 17 goals of the, what we call a sustainable development goals. This was set to be finished in 2020. But because of the late kickstart of many of the programs throughout the world, countries who are participating in this exercise, the UN General Secretary body, which meets regularly in many of the COP events, has decided that another 10 years will be taken forward so that quantitatively every country can tell how much they have achieved in terms of these sustainable development goals, okay? So my prime focus today, and being a marine biologist, my prime focus will be on SDG 14, which talks about the life below water. Now, life below water also is very important in terms of ecosystems and habitats, but also it is linked very closely to SDG 13 and 15. 13, climate change, because all of us are facing a severe climate crisis. And uh, life on land, the terrestrial part, okay, the littoral forest, the salt marsh vegetation, the mangroves, there are many other sensitive ecosystems on the terrestrial part, which all join together as an integral uh, part of the entire coastal and ocean system. And once, if these are addressed, you see there is a linkage to other SDGs. For example, when there is sufficient environmental safeguard, then you see that there is a lot of uh, food availability. You have fishes, you have other associated groups that have been harvested, and automatically that gives good health. And then you see that we also have sustainable cities and communities. And cities are also benefited because their supply of protein. And likewise, they can go on. Every SDG is interconnected. There can be poverty decline. You can bring down poverty. There will be gender equality in working spaces. Water can be clean because these natural systems help in come upstream to the ocean. You can see that the water is being purified in different forms. So you can see how these are all interconnected very, very well. Okay, So this is just a uh, startup for us to understand that it was not just like that that UN decided to bring a title or a theme of uh, the decade of ecosystem restoration from 2021 20, to 2030. It was mainly because SDGs that set 10 years back, one decade back. We are not able to meet them, and now we are trying to push it forward to make sure that our commitment to the uh, climate change, our commitment to various protocols, the Mount Protocol, and so on, will be met. When Altaf sir was talking about the environment, my colleague just sent a uh, paper clip. And it was very interesting because that's very, very relevant to the topic I'm going to speak today, that researchers have restored 14 acres of seagrass to save dugong in the Gulf of Manar. Okay, that's a very interesting one. This is done by the Wildlife Institute of India. And uh, probably you can Google it out when you, when you finish the meeting and you get back home, that this particular information about the uh, you know, uh, seagrass restoration, 14 acres, 
which is a good achievement, has been carried out. Okay, having said that, uh, my top topic for today, as desired by our organizers, is restoration of seagrass. And I'm proud to say that seagrass is one of the most important underwater filter system that is making sure sediments are trapped and good refined pure water goes into the environment to feed coral reefs where you see this this is not very visible in many of the areas where seagrass are there but if you see in gulf of manar in park bay in uh, andaman nicobar in gulf of kerch in lakshadweep wherever the corals are there the seagrass form the primary barrier by which runoff sediments from the terrestrial area is filtered and then good water is sent to the coral because more of sediments come into the uh, coral area then you see that the corals are degraded and there is a mass mortality of them. This is coupled with the sea surface temperature increase leading to El Nino and other phenomena. Before I uh, go into uh, uh, you know, uh, what a seagrass is, why we need to study on seagrass, why there is a restoration uh, requirement for it, I would like to introduce you to the Government Gazette, which is the CRZ notification of 2019. It came in 2011 first, when first the ecologically sensitive areas or ESAs were identified. The 11 of them we call it A to K, you can see on the screen. And uh, in that, it was brought by the ministry's notice that there are certain sensitive systems which need conservation or protection status. So based on this, the 2011 notification was updated. It's all based on the Environment Protection Act. Under Environment Protection Act, we see that the CRZ 2011 notification, which was modified one from the 90s, and then currently in 2019, we had a, another updated uh, uh, notification, and now we refer it to only CRZ. The CRZ stands for Coastal Regulations Notification. In that, there is one part in as per 2.1.1, which is called as ESA or the CRZ1 areas, okay? Primarily areas of conservation. And you see there are mangroves, corals, sand dunes, mudflats, MPAs, salt marsh, turtle nesting grounds, horseshoe crabs, seagrass beds, nesting grounds of birds, and areas of archaeological and heritage sites. So these are basically the ESAs. I want you to, I want to introduce this first before I go into it. And uh, I'll be focusing more on the seagrass beds because of the constant of time. And uh, we see this is NCSM's work, okay? Our center was, uh, we, we are very young in terms of that. Uh, it was uh, established in 2009, 11. By the time we came into full swing functioning, it was 2013 when we were all recruited. And when we recruited from 14 onwards, we had three major national uh, you know, the, the assignments to be completed by the ministry. One was the map mapping of the entire hazard line for the country. Second was demarcation of coastal sediment cells for the country. And then delineation of ESA and also CVCA, critically vulnerable, coast, vulnerable coastal areas. So this was a major task given to the institution. And we were able to complete all this successfully. And in all the planning that happens in the Ministry of Environment along the coast, our, all our uh, interventions, all our research findings are going into policy directly. So now I'll come into uh, the details of these ecology sensitive areas. You see that there were isolated A to K, 11 systems, okay? Now among that, mangroves, coral, seagrass, and salt marsh, these four are called as ecosystems because they support a wide uh, array of organisms dependent on it. And they also give place for breeding and for uh, feeding of many organisms. So the next three are called as habitats because these are very specific. Now, habitat is a place where an animal or a bird or an organism comes, lives for a short time, goes back, or lives there to complete the life cycle. It can be either ways, okay? So this is a habitat. And you see that bird nesting sites, because birds, they migrate. There can be, uh, you know, they, they're not fixed in one place. They move from one place to another. So there can be a local migration or it can be a faraway migration or, a, you know, uh, long 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 range migration so they come for a particular they come to breed they come to avoid the cold winters or they come to avoid the severe summer and they come to this place to breed or to feed or to grow and you can see turtle nesting turtle nesting sites again very important is that the turtles do not come to the shore both the turtles do not come to the shore the males never come to the shore it's only the female that comes to the shore and lays his eggs you know and then gets back into the ocean so the sand dunes and sand, be, between intertidal and sand dune areas of every coast known for turtle nesting is very important because this is the place where the eggs are buried, <coughs> closed, and after certain days, they start to hatch out into hatchlings. And the third is the horseshoe crab habitat. But don't be, uh, mistake, don't be misguided by the term horseshoe crab. This is not a crab. Horseshoe crabs are basically, uh, they, are, they are of course arthropods, but they come under a 
class called arachnida which includes uh, scorpions and spiders because they have jointed legs and they have multiple jointed appendages very close to each other so that's why they're called as the arachnids so this we have only two species in india and uh, horseshoe crabs are distributed only from north of andhra odisha and uh, south of west bengal you don't find them anywhere else in the east coast or in the west, west coast or in the islands of india so basically out of the 11 the first four are the, the four are ecosystems three are habitats and we are going to see about the seagrass slowly and then we see there are also two geomorphological features that is the sand dunes and mudflats again very very important uh, mudflats are biologically very active though many people see no activity there they are very very biologically active they are important uh, bird foraging grounds and sand dunes again play a very important role in trapping groundwater and also acting as natural barriers against uh, storm surges and you know also heavy winds so again very very important what is missing here is the marine protected areas mpa and uh, uh, this uh, all the uh, wildlife reserves the uh, reserve forests the you know the uh, marine protected areas the biosphere reserves and all other they all come under the mpa and finally the archaeological heritage site so we as ncsm have mapped all of them and we know exactly how much square kilometer of these are there in the entire country and this has gone into every state's planning process along the coast under the uh, CCDP coastal zone uh, regulation maps uh, management plans of the, every state like for the Tamil Nadu T and CCDMA there's a Tamil Nadu coastal zone management authority under the Ministry of Environment they will be using this maps and these places map will be avoided for any developmental activity along the coast okay and just skip this one right now the question is why we should conserve why we should restore why we should protect seagrass what is so important we see grass on the terrestrial environment and grass is there because uh, uh, it, it helps in the entire uh, barren land to be green in nature it gives a very beautiful look to our eye and then we see that only if rain is there post rain for some season for, for a few months you can see the grass growing then when summer starts automatically they die again the rain comes you see the cycle starts to come back again but when it rains when the green grass is there you see how much of life comes in there are more butterflies there are insects there are ants and there are many other uh, uh, snakes and other uh, reptiles larger reptiles which live or use the environment for their uh, feeding or predating and you can also see in the terrestrial environment it is it, the grasses form a very important food for all the uh, primary consumers basically the ungulates or the, the the cow the sheep all the cattle group the deer you know antelopes all of them start feeding on them so this is the terrestrial view of the seagrass now uh, of the terrestrial grass exactly the same thing is is can be said about the sea grasses okay they are not different from the terrestrial grass they are both monocots they are both flowering and so on okay so now we will see one by one why there's a need to protect now as i told you even has declared this entire uh, 10 years or one decade from 2021 to 2030 as the uh, uh, UN uh, as the uh, system uh, ecosystem uh, restoration decade okay and why we it's we have to do this because we are now evaluating and seeing for the last 30 years we have started to do a lot of conservation initiatives we have implemented many projects and we are now trying to see what success they have is it having an increase of mangrove cover or is it having a decrease of mangrove cover if it's an increase what are the reasons is it because of plantation interventions is it because of community-based systems or is it because of good protection status or the mangroves are coming in the protected area? If it is being degraded, then what is the reason? Are the mangroves being cleared for aquaculture activities? Are mangroves being cleared for other developmental activities like ecotourism or, or sorry, tourism? Or is it being cleared for other thermal plants and so on? So that evaluation of the past will help us to find out what status we are in currently and then more than the anthropogenic pressure we also see there is also a climate angle to it we have the temperature increasing every year you are all following ipcc's uh, uh, st simulated studies of predictions and you know how much it's going to be you know, one centimeter then there are many parts in tamil Nadu, in is going to go underwater so if there is an increase then how much is lost we do not know so to keep all this calculated to keep a check on this we have to go into the restoration concept okay so once we now analyze what is there by 2030 we will know how much percentage of every ecosystem that is the mangroves coral seagrass okay and the salt marsh besides that we also have very very small ecosystems all of them can be restored and we can see how much benefits or ecosystem goods and services these bring to the environment so this is the idea of having this even declaring the ecosystem restoration decay 
Right. Now, the most important thing for us to understand is the difference between an algae and a seagrass. This is a very confusing uh, thing. Uh, people who have, uh, you know, kind of uh, played along with this terrestrial seagrass, or if you have, you know, uh, cattle at home, or you have been to any of the, uh, you know, uh, areas where good landscapes are there, you can easily look at a grass and tell it's a grass. And similarly, in the water environment, there will be a little bit of confusion between the algae, which is a macrophyte, and the seagrass. Now, algae are not monocots or advanced plants, flowering plants like seagrass. Now, differences you can see very clearly. Seagrass has got a very, very prominent root system, okay, adventitious root system. And you can see that, you know, they have rhizomes or thick structures which are able to trap down a lot of required microbial uh, load, which in turn helps in uh, converting nitrogenous material for the growth of the plants from the sediments. And uh, in the case of an algae, you see, they have only holdfast. Holdfast are structures that are designed in their body to attach to any hard substrata that is having calcareous or any other material that is suitable for it to settle down. And uh, you see that algae also reproduces by two, both by asexual and bisexual methods, meaning to say that they can propagate if the fragments fall down into a new individual or they can start sporulating, okay? And uh, that's based again on the availability of climatic conditions and favorable environment. In the case of seagrass, they are all, uh, they have to disperse, seeds are produced, almost like any sea, uh, all, uh, the terrestrial grass, okay? And they flower, that's why they call it flowering monocots. They flower very small flowers underwater, and if the flowers are formed only, then the seed starts to form. So just like the normal plants that we have, they're not flowering and fruiting, the same thing happens to the uh, seagrass. Uh, only thing is that they submerge underwater and they love silty, clay kind of an, uh, sediment structure for them to settle down and grow. So that's the basic difference, difference between algae and seagrass. Algae is classified into red algae, brown algae, green algae, and cyanobacteria. Okay, the peophytes uh, or the chlorophytes or the cyanophytes and also the uh, you know the rhodophytes, the four classes you have. But seagrass is very specific to the uh, dicot group, uh, monocot group, and they are uh, strictly flowering plants. Now, uh, as, I, as I now introduce you to the seagrass, you must know what functionalities these uh, seagrass play in terms of providing ecosystem goods and services. Now, this is a classification done by us based on the four major topics, cultural services. The cultural service, the provisioning service, regulating and supporting services, okay? Now, this is a classification that we follow from TEEP. Okay, the ecosystem uh, uh, ecosystem assessment uh, uh, services. They have a methodology by which they have brought in a lot of concepts to be brought to, to be undertaken when we, you know, kind of explain the goods and services by, by seagrass uh, ecosystem or any other ecosystem for that matter. So you see, in cultural system, we we can see ecotourism plays a very important role. There's a lot of education and research going on. A lot of researchers, uh, you know, undertaking what kind of biodiversity is available, what are the carbon sequestration potential for a given specific area, and uh, what kind of animal life they support, and uh, what natural barriers they play in terms of climate change and so on. And you can see fishing again is very important. Okay, there is a there is a big dependency of on uh, uh, seagrass fishing in in many of the places, not just in India, throughout the world. And in terms of provisioning services, there's a lot of green manure. If you go to uh, the, the, the biggest uh, mainland deposits of seagrass is, uh, you know, it's in Gulf of Manara, Park Bay in Tamil Nadu. You know, we should be happy the biggest or the best seagrass cover comes in our state, Tamil Nadu state, okay? And in Gulf of Manara, Park Bay, Park Bay is still, still, you know, very, very dense and very thick, tall grasses are seen. So once the currents move, there's a shifting and change of currents, you see that the seagrass blades break and the blades come and settle down on the shore, it will be in mass. It will be like for one feet, two feet high. And these become natural menu and these menu are excellent. We have done some vermicomposting experiments way back in 2002 where we used seagrass. We vermicompost seagrass with an earthworm that was found in the, in the shore itself, salt, uh, a salt tolerant uh, uh, earthworm. And then we saw that the menu was very, very good for you know, uh, uh, for any kind of uh, 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 agricultural purpose or for, you know, ornamental purpose. And then seagrass is also used for roofing because of the dried seagrass can be used to protect, and you know, on, on top of the roof to give more <coughs> tensile strength and, for, and protection against many of the weathering processes that happens in the environment. And there are a lot of, lot of medicinal properties available in seagrass. Some countries and some researchers also 
have extracted some novel product. They have tried antibacterial, antimicrobial. You know, you're a, you're a biotechnologist. Most of you know that you no know, many many activities have taken place, and then it also uses fodder. Okay, and uh, so there are uh, cattle that graze on it. I have seen myself uh, uh, cattle, sheep, you know, uh, goats going and feeding on them, donkeys feeding on them. In Gujarat, we can see even camels feeding on them. So it is actually good. It's got a little salty taste because from sea, but then it is very. <coughs> you, I mean, it is consumed very well. In terms of regulating service, you see that it have a very high potential of carbon sequestration next to mangroves. Okay, <clears throat> when you when you talk about the carbon sequestration of the entire world, more than the terrestrial, the coastal and the marine are you know high in terms of sequestering carbon. Number one is mangrove, number two is seagrass, and we will just see a little bit of it later. You can see it also enhances water quality, as I told you earlier. It purifies the sediment that comes from the terrestrial runoff and then sends good water for corals and into deeper waters. And it also acts as coastal protection, pro prevents uh, soil erosion, uh, binds the soil together as the actual plants that happen terrestrial environment. Same thing happens in the marine environment. They bind it together and they act as very important climate change checkers. They check the climate change. We know that climate change event inevitable is happening is real. And there's a question mark. There's one uh, working group of people who say that climate change is not real. It's a, it's it's an argument that goes on. There's a lot of controversial discussions going on. But still, all said and done, this is the role played by seagrass. And in terms of supporting service, he said that it is very important uh, place where uh, fishers and other invertebrates live, and also it is an important place where the fishes can breed, young ones can breed. Okay, so this is in general about the uh, provision, the, the various ecosystem goods and services provided by seagrass. On the right side, you have an image of a seagrass that is uh, one of my favorite seagrasses, Syringodium isotifolium. It is actually a very thin, pointed one, a very common uh, one found in the east coast of India. So now I will just go a little bit into the carbon sequestration potential. This is the work done by our institution, a different team. We have a climate change team that works on it, and they have, uh, you know, identified. Uh, they have calculated the how much of how much productivity is there. So uh, you know, they say phytoplankton is very important, and they have a very uh, important role in, in net productivity. And you know, uh, in, in its net con uh, community productivity, you can see that it is 3.12 and mmol cm square per demon. Whereas in seagrass, you see it's 65 to 232. You know, it's almost uh, 30, 40 times or 60 times more or, you know, 20 times more than the actual production capacity of the uh, uh, phytoplankton, which is found everywhere in the ocean. Whereas seagrass are found only in areas where light penetration is there and uh, where temperatures do not go beyond a uh, few 15 or 16 degrees. Because we also have uh, cold water seagrasses, but beyond that, uh, uh, just above the uh, temperate region, we see there is no seagrass growth. And uh, and this is the potential, again, this is again the research done by our own team. Uh, our our uh, division, which is called Future Research, works on climate change studies. So they have uh, identified the capacity of uh, uh, carbon storage and you know, carbon sequestration, you know, and they have compared and it's published also in between a healthy seagrass ecosystem and a degraded eco seagrass ecosystem. Not this just, you see that one acre of seagrass can sequester 3,350 kg of carbon per year. That's pretty high. And uh, they can mitigate carbon dioxide emissions from automobile uh, traveling 6,212 kilometers, okay? And they can absorb 2.9 kg of nutrients per year. And uh, the Zyklon 2 treated effluent from 490 people, so which means that the effluent runoffs or the, you know, the domestic waste and uh, from STPs and everything which comes off the treated effluent from 490 people, from there, it is able to absorb 2.9 kg of nutrients. If nutrients are minimized before entering into any coastal water body into the ocean, then you see it minimizes the effect of or the production of harmful algal blooms, which lead to mass fish kill and destruction of the environment. And they also provide a, a, a service worth of 11, 11 lakhs of uh, uh, ecosystem services for year. Okay, probably I'm not sure whether they have calculated for uh, one acre or 10 acres. But then you can still imagine the kind of potential these seagrass have when they are protected and they kept safe. Now here we we have a picture of uh, the entire global distribution of seagrass. You can see even on the you know the temperate regions, you can see there's a lot of seagrass growing. But you see that diversity is between zero to thirty degree latitude or within the equatorial point, the tropical regions, because good light is there warm waters there and because of that we have up to 20 species okay there is a study which says that uh, as per there's a, a there's a 
uh, uh, institution called the Sigaras Watch, which has been functioning for more than now 15, 16 years. And they have documented close to 60 species of seagrass throughout the world. But here we're talking about in every zone, how much species can be there. And you can see India here. I'm just uh, trying to move my cursor close to India. You can see a lightly dark green color. And then actually near Sri Lanka, on the Park Bend Gulf of Manasar, actually it is very dark green because we have 14 species that have been identified in India. Right? So we have a good number. And out of the all the 14 species identified in India are found in Gulf of Manar side and I, I believe that it might be also being park based because park based site still remains to be uh, underexplored and uh, we might have more interesting finding coming out when there's a lot of uh, research, research work carried out in the coming days. And uh, the other seagrass picture that you see on the right side is uh, Thalassia, again a very interesting species uh, with broad blades and uh, you can never see it complete because you know the, the blade tip always breaks off. I'll tell you why in a few moments. So that is the global distribution. Now coming to India, you can see that uh, this image is taken by us. This is a normal uh, quadrant that we use to uh, study the uh, you know density of seagrass. There is there are standard methodology we follow English at all's work. We have one more researcher who very strictly we follow for the uh, density or biomass of uh, seagrass uh, available in the environment. And you can see uh, on the India map here on my left on the left side of your screen that. Uh, Coral mango solved by the four major ecosystems of India. And then you can also see the places where the seagrasses are, are found to be in a good numbers. Okay, and the seagrass that you see on the right side is Simodesia ceruleta. Okay, again, a very, very serration you can see on the leaf blades. Again, a very, very interesting and a very uh, highly dense species. And uh, the, this is fed upon by uh, turtles and also by dugongs, which I'll explain a little later. Again, this is again from published paper from a different team our, and from our own office. You can see the places in Gulf of Kutch, Lakshadweep, Park Bend, Gulf of Mannar, Andaman Nicobar, and Chilika Lake. These are the uh, big seagrass ecosystems that we have in India. But having said that, the, the best seagrass ecosystem is in the Park Bay. Very thick, very dense, and just awesome. If you have an opportunity, probably you should snorkel or dive there and see. And uh, what I say, you'll be able to, uh, you know, remember, uh, you can be able to see it. When you have a look at there. Now, this is again a map prepared by our institution, and one of my colleagues from a different team, again from the remote sensing team, she has mapped the entire seagrass available in the Gulf of Manar and Park Bay using remote sensing techniques, using spectral library signatures. So, this is a very uh, in, a new kind of a study that's happening where we use spectral signatures and plot the seagrass bed using many, many satellite data, many, many different types of satellite data and working on, and you can see, when compared to Gulf of Manar on the southern side, this is Gulf of Manar, I hope we can see, you can see my uh, cursor moving over, this is Gulf of Manar, and all the mesh there talks about the, uh, you know, the islands, what the islands, four group of islands in Gulf of Manar, and then you can see the park beside how thick the vegetation of uh, seagrass are, okay, that's again very, very interesting to have a look, okay, but this map was prepared for a different purpose, but still, I'm mean, just trying to tell you the thick vegetation, thick, dense nature of seagrass found in the Park Bay area. Now, okay, what about the biodiversity dependent on seagrass? We see there are, Altafs are very clearly pointed, okay? The microorganisms are very important. And there are microinvertebrates, there are macroinvertebrates, there are myofauna and macrofauna. All these play a very important role in the food chain because from the phytic group to the zoo group, you see that they are the basal broad structure in the food pyramid. They play a very important role in the trophic system. So you see that from the smallest on the left to the maximum on the right, how seagrass supports life forms. Microscopic organisms, right from plankton to you know uh, many other groups, then you see that invertebrates, then crustaceans, crustacea itself is an invertebrate here. Invertebrate is purely given because it's a class. There are many groups like I see the, I mean the many groups like uh, you know, uh, bryozoans uh, or uh, other groups that are found there, then crustaceans, which is the crab group, okay, the crab, the shrimp, and uh, those groups, the lobsters, those groups, and then mollusks, all the soft bird animals, and fish species, and birds, seabirds, okay. There are birds who dive and take their food down, and there are birds that depend on seagrass. Uh, when the, the dead seagrass floats on top and comes, there are organisms sitting on top, fish come to feed that, and which I, to trap that fish, the birds go and eat them. So again, we see that there's a lot of linkages. And then you see sea turtles, a reptile that loves to feed on seagrass. And of course, <clears throat> the sea cow, dugong, which is a very important uh, 
flagship species, mainly in the Gulf of Manar Black Bay, only very few left. Okay, the today's Indian Express paper list talks about that. Only 250 are remaining in this uh, in the country, and uh, you know we want to have. Uh, it will be better protected only if you have good habitats because this is the feeding habitat for the uh, mammal like uh, you know mammals like uh, the dugong and uh, the turtles like uh, you know the sea, the sea turtles like the green and uh, oxbills <clears throat> okay now uh, coming to the single leaf blade okay now we see the seagrass never looks very clean it's always having some kind of dirt growing on some kind of filamentous stuff going on it okay there's some kind of other organisms and never 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 you know, clean. That's mainly because seagrass blades provide an important substrate for many microscopic organisms, which we call as epiphytes. And you can see this image, which is drawn in 2001 by Hoff Richter, gives an idea about what small microscopic groups can live on the sea, seagrass blade. Indiv every individual blade, if a seagrass plant has got 15 blades, and every individual blade will have this kind of groups growing. There are hydrozoans, bryozoans, acidians, anthozoans, tassive animals, polychid worms, which are again nonlid group, then coralinaceae, it's a kind of uh, calcareous algal forms, all growing on top of that. And as I told you earlier, the seagrass, the broader seagrass blade will never be complete. It will be broken on the top. Why? Because seagrass, tap, they trap all sediments on their leaf, and then these microorganisms try to grow on top of the leaves, and because of that, the seagrass becomes more in weight and the blade starts to bend down and then break off because of the heavy weight. And what is broken is brought to the shore. And when they're broken, this contains a lot of food material that's eaten up by fish. They're floating and coming, okay? They float and go. Some of them, they're very heavy, they sink down to the bottom. But still the current will try to push it close to the shore and the fish will be coming to feed on them. And the, to follow the fish, bigger fish will come, octopus will come, Cuttlefish will come and then to feed on them, there'll be birds coming or even fishermen will be able to catch his good, uh, you know, a food, uh, food fish for him when the entire process happens. So this is the microscopic, it's, uh, we talk about seagrass ecosystem, but every leaf pair itself is a micro habitat, micro niche for so many other groups on there. Now, again, this is a, just a clear, uh, just a small uh, glimpse of, I'm just showing you very, very small view about what groups of animals. You have a gastropod mollusk there grazing on the microscopic uh, food particles available on the blade. You can see a sea anemone here, okay? It's not that sea anemones are found only attached to rocks or, you know, in, in uh, buried in sediments. They love to grow on top of the seagrass because that's a good substrate for them. And, uh, you know, they can mimic with the seagrass and they can trap their food with their tentacles and feed well. And uh, just the image down to it is a gastropod egg mass. Egg masses can be, it's a good place for egg mass can be deposited. Again, uh, because this, again, seagrass gives an opportunity for the egg mass to develop, they'll hatch out. So it becomes a nursery for, for fishes, for other invertebrates to breed and grow from there. And on the right side, the beautiful, colorful one is a nudibranch. Nudibranchs are, again, gastropods. Nudi, nuda means uh, naked, Branca, branchia means gills. So in Latin, it means naked gills. Their gills are open. and uh, they are gastropods, unlike the one on the left side, they don't have shell. The shell is internal or vestigial. So this is an example of them. And they also start feeding on the uh, uh, leaf blades because they, the gastropods mollusks, they have a, a, a ribbon-like teeth called radula. With that, they can just keep rolling about like, you know, like a, a saw machine. They'll keep scraping, 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 eating all the algal and other invertebrate uh, uh, groups that are found on the leaf blades. But larger invertebrate, okay? Now, sea cucumbers are... Uh, found to be a very important associated species of seagrass. If seagrass levels or the population of seagrass or density comes down, the first species to get a larger impact will be the sea cucumbers because sea cucumbers play again a very important role. Just like the uh, seagrass traps sediments and filters the water, at the bottom, the sea cucumber eats all the dead and decomposing matter and converts them from organic and inorganic, again supplying for the environment. So they play the role of a scavenger in the seagrass beds because seagrass beds also have anoxic uh, gas released all the time because of the leaves falling down or being transported. The, the ones that have fallen down are decomposing all the time, but this becomes the food for them and they convert it. And this is how God has created the entire environment. And all the small bead like pellets that you see are the fecal pellets of the sea cucumbers. They leave a tail behind like a small bead like arrangement that's nothing but the fecal pellets and the waste material. Okay, they are uh, sea cucumbers again, they are in the group uh, class called Holothoroidea. The larger phylum called Echinodermata. Echinodermata means spine bearing. 
so they are like a, like a, like a, like a worms but uh, they have a lot of water content inside and you know they are found to be one of the most important associated groups in uh, the seagrass beds interestingly we also see fish species as like the seahorse now seahorse as, as you all know is a very slow swimming species but it's got a very powerful prehensile tail a tail by which it can hold the substrate okay an uh, equivalent of this to the terrestrial environment is the chameleon the pachavundi they call it okay that again has got a prehensile tail to attach itself when it moves on top of you know any uh, tree or any any place it, and it gives a sturdiness for it uh, it's almost it's like a fifth leg but for the seahorse here because they cannot tolerate high currents because the sea grasses are in shallow waters and you can feel the current very much in shallow waters and you can see them growing there very well okay that's one thing i want to share here and next thing as i told you it's very important for uh, feeding it's an important feeding ground this is here we can see a green turtle kilonia midas a very common species we also have the olive ridley the lepidocalus olivaceae these two are important uh, turtle species which try to they feed on almost three to four species of uh, sea grass okay so they become very important feeding grounds and then there are also beyond the sea grass beds there will be lots of stingrays or even skates that bury themselves in the soil in the sediment with only their spiracles and eye outside what you see here is a spiracle spiracle is a place where it's able to breathe okay they are like gills slits like you find in sharks now the stingrays and uh, sharks and the skates all come together in one uh, group called as one class called elasma branchi okay and uh, elasma branchi is mainly because they don't have uh, they are not bony fishes but they have cartilage they have cartilage in them okay so they the way of cartilage so they are found to live close to sea grass or in sea grass because there are a lot of interesting crabs which they love see actually with the love they like to their, their mouths on the ventral side not on dorsal the ventral side so they'll go on top of the crab is they're going to attach the crab attack the crab and break it into pieces and then enjoy their meal so the good meal you get again in sea grass beds of course the greatest of all the biggest of uh, uh, mammal that we have in the land here for india per se uh, close to the land is the dugong scientifically called as dugong dugon and uh, it comes in the order sirenia in mammalia and uh, this is uh, exactly a cow okay and uh, interesting see that can you see that they are using their both their uh, flips okay and uh, they are able to walk with that like a cow walks and starts grazing and they leave a beautiful tail when they graze we have done a lot of recording we have have a couple of papers also coming up now where we have seen dugo feeding track underwater my team has done some work uh, identifying their feeding trails very interesting and uh, these again are flagship species now what is a flagship species we have keystone species we have a, a cultural species like that but what is a flagship species a flagship species is a species which is promoted for advertisement to say that if you protect the species you have to protect the environment if you protect the environment then the entire system will be fine this is exactly same to the protection of tigers project tiger in india or elephants okay and uh, it's almost similar we call them flagship species or so, dugong is a flagship species for gulf of manna and for uh, the pagbe area in the mainland of india and uh, the logo of the gulf of manar biosphere reserve trust based in ramnadapuram under the tamil nadu forest department has the dugong as this logo so the sea grass is very very important for the dugong to survive and as i told you the today's newspaper cutting india express tells us that we have only 250 species left okay now what are the major threats to the sea grass okay now what we see is that the most important thing is the habitat destruction we have a lot of coastal projects coming we have thermal plants we have aquaculture industries we have salt pans we have uh, other you know uh, uh, tourist destinations coming up bridges coming up ports coming up all this plays a major impact on the seagrass because when all this process happen there will be some kind of a work done in the water part uh, dredging or deepening and this will cause heavy sedimentation and sedimentation traps more than the expected sedimentation on the seagrass and it will lead to the death of seagrass they'll be totally buried only a few which can survive will come out and you know grow it's like you know having a rose plant at home and putting lot of soil on top of it to kill the plant but if the rose plant is lucky maybe out of the five only one will shoot out and come that's kind of a scenario we have and the second thing is that we also see that there's lot of overfishing in seagrass area the kind of nets are trawl nets bottom trawl net they just mow the entire bed break all the seagrass and along with it take all the organisms and ultimately what happens the trawl net when operates what comes to shore is only the very very few food of commercial value or fish of commercial value 
twenty percent, thirty percent, the rest seventy percent, eighty percent goes as trash waste, which should have been which should have been left in the environment so that in the future they could have been important sources. But that's what's happening right now. And here is a very small poster that is brought up by IUCN and uh, uh, Convention of Migratory Species, this Abu Dhabi CMS. So they have brought some of the important uh, threats to seagrass. You see, there's a coastal development and the sea filling that's being a problem to destroy it, and the bad boating practices, which talks about anchoring. When you put anchors in unwanted areas, then what happens is that we have a we have a problem of you know uh, we have a problem of uh, uh, the seagrass is getting destroyed very badly, and we also have effluents, as we saw earlier, domestic untreated sewage or effluent that are released in the ocean directly to the coastal water, coastal systems impact. But now we have a greater problem. We have a problem of invasive species. Now, what is invasive species? An invasive species is a species that comes new to an environment, starts to grow, and overtakes the native of native equivalent of that species. That's an invasive species, okay? And uh, and can happen within the system or from a country outside. When you have a country from outside, then we call this invasive alien species or exact exotic alien species. As I told you, trawling is there. Dredging is there, this is all problem, okay? Now, what the CMS tells is that CMS is again part of the UN system of conservation, and uh, they say that mostly in many countries we do not have a legislative protection. Thank God, in India, after the uh, it has been classified in 2011 notification as ecological sensitive area, we have a status, legal status for ecological sensitive area, and in which seagrass ecosystem path forms a part. And for any developmental activities, clearance has to be sought from the ministry for the development activity to carry on. Okay, and as, as, as here, you can see here, it's just grass. Many of them do not know what these grasses are and what role they play and there's lack of awareness. So as the ministry's mandate, as many NGOs, as many CBOs, as many research institutions, both private and national level or the state level, what we do is that we try to take the information to the community. Some communities know it, about it very well. Some communities do not know, but there has to be an awareness creation not just with them, to the schools, to the colleges, there has to be a very important awareness to be created that seagrass plays a major role in many, many ways. And you can see, because of that, what's going to happen is that we are going to face something called ocean acidification. It's already started. We have a lot of uh, simulated studies already telling the impact it causes on foraminiferans, on uh, other, you know, ostracodes and other kind of uh, theropod mollusks. But then these seagrass trap, okay, they trap extra carbon, they, you know, you know that plants always take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. So they keep the environment rich. They minimize the impacts of uh, uh, ocean acidification. So this all, this is a very important, uh, you know, angle to look at because we can, by creating more and more green infrastructures, you know, green uh, living infrastructures or nature-based infrastructure, we see that we're able to minimize slowly and steadily the impact that's going to be caused, right? And we also see that we saw that how much carbon it stores. And as I told you, they a very important role as feeding grounds for turtles and for dugongs. Okay, now coming to the methods, right? We saw what seagrasses are. We saw how they are different from uh, the algae. And uh, we also uh, went through the distribution of them globally in India. And then we saw uh, what kind of diversity it has got, what are the ecosystem goods and services provide, and why it needs to be conserved. And there are specific methods that we can follow for conservation. So uh, there are, I mean, in India, you see there are plenty of simple methods that are followed, uh, simple methods like, you know, plugging them. I just, one by one, but I first talk about the very popular method. This is a, these are methods are sedimentary methods. You can see that the, a small uh, fragment of a seagrass is taken, then it's tied to a small uh, wooden substrate, and then we have a peg or a clip that is given to plug it inside the soil. What happens is that if we do not plug them properly, the currents will move them away. Okay, and there are certain areas the current is very high. When you go and stand, there also you can see the water is dragging you. When you're scuba diving or snorkeling, you can see still it's just pushing you from the place where you want to actually do the, uh, the initiate, conservation initiative. So these are areas where you see this kind of plugs are used or this kind of structures are used to put them. It can be an iron nail, it can be anything, you just to keep it intact. So these are called sedimentary methods. The second method is that use eco friendly material. These are mats, square mats prepared from just, uh, you know, Waste products, you know, our gunny bags, again, are very important because these will start disintegrating in the future and they'll be eco-friendly, like used eco-friendly bags. These are like, they'll go into the environment, they'll become, as and they'll be converted into an inorganic material in the later times. So here, these mats are used and the grasses are 
you know, kind of plug them inside them, tie together, so that at the later stage they start establishing themselves. Now these are deposited in area where there are not extensive seagrass already present. Basically, all the plantation or the restoration method happens in areas where it's barren or free or degraded. That's the most important thing. These are the areas. Not to go and plant an area already when you have seagrass. You have to find out areas adjacent to it, beyond it, or areas where seagrass are not present. The third sediment-free method is that tying a metal frame and then fixing the seagrass fragments to them. And uh, why a metal frame? Because metal frame has got weight. Now, this method is used for deeper waters. You can just take the frame, drop it down. It will slowly go down, settle, and then you don't have to dive and waste our energy or waste oxygen or waste, you know, snorkeling method. It becomes a very cost-effective and a very simple uh, installation method rather than the other method. So these are the three popular sediment-free methods which is used in uh, many of the French pollination countries like Kiribati, Vanuatu, also in Southern Africa, and we also see them in uh, Pacific Ocean countries. So all these places you see that this kind of a sediment-free method is used. We also have the sediment method where we can use a core to dig down and take the entire, uh, you know, the, the entire uh, seagrass along with the with the mud. Now these are we can you can ask me why we have disturbed some already established seagrass, but some places there will be, uh, you know, the density is very thick. Hundred percent. If you put a quadrant, as I showed you earlier, when you put a quadrant, it will be hundred percent seagrass. From there, these can be mother sites from where you can take the little bit of seagrass and transplant them to an area where it is not there. So uh, if you can use a spade method if the water is very shallow, or you can use a broader core with a messenger. You know, if it's deeper water, you can send on the message, it taps, and then it goes a little deeper and locks and brings sediment out. Or again, you can use a PVC corer for need of water. So this sediment method helps in, uh, you know, collecting them and again going in fragment. One sediment, we, and we try to put it back. Uh, in the areas using the same method, okay? You have to use the spade again in the area where you don't have seagrass. Remove the soil, put them, cover them. Or put the corers, put them, take the soil out, and then put this inside, cover up the soil so that the uh, these plants can be, uh, seagrass can be growing there well. Now, a very interesting method, the seeding method, where <clears throat> you use, uh, you know, uh, nylon bags and you collect the seeds. You put the seeds inside, okay? But, but, but see, every method has got its own drawback. Let me just explain to that, and we, then I'll come to the method. Now, in this method, the, the advantage is that you don't waste, waste much material. A lot of time is saved, and uh, you know a lot of manpower is saved. But the disadvantage is that uh, if the currents are very high, at the time of deploying, they can be moved away from the exact place of transportation. And what happens when you plant also, the disadvantage is that you also have some grazing fishes. They come and feed, feed on the seagrass. Or even if turtles are there, they love to feed on that and they just come and trace and go off. In the case of the sediment method, you see that the weight is more. In the water, you will not feel the water weight. But when you bring it out, the weight is too much. So planting them, and there are every chance when you take it under water, currents can disperse or completely dissolve the soil. And you can see only the grass being there. So that's again a disadvantage. The third place, uh, third, third method, seeding method, what happens here is that when you put all the seeds, collect them together. First, you must know which are the months you'll get the seeds. So you cannot do this activity restoration method throughout the year. You have to have certain time duration only to put the seeds, seeds and then allow them to float. You can see them floating. That's mainly because they start growing and once they increase in their density, they'll start to sink down. You know, it's not that, no, it's just, it'll be floating on. There's ample space given form of rope so that as the weight grows more, it starts sinking down and then the roots develop, they start settling down and going well. Okay, again, these are, again, uh, developed countries have many more advanced technologies. You see that how seeds are collected here on the, in, in the tubs. On the first, you see the same method as I told you, the, the boy method. And this is a, a very interesting new method. They call it as the uh, disperse injection, dispenser injection method, okay, where uh, they take some uh, sediment, then they put the seagrass uh, uh, shoot or, you know, the, the going shoot or a seed together in a cluster. And then they use a gun, the common kind of gun used for, you know, the, the gluing of glass, the silicone that glues. They use a special water gun and the water gun, they, and they pull it inside and dig, uh, you know, they put the nozzle inside and they put the <coughs> uh, seed and they plug it completely there. Now, this, there's a sealant inside. Now, the sealant helps in keeping the, uh, transplant without moving or being uh, you know completely removed from the place because of very high currents okay but how effective it is it's still an experiment okay because the silicon uh, uh, or the any other uh, sealant that is used 
might interfere, may cover them, and they're not allowed to grow them. That's one thing. Okay, and you can see different methods here. Here you can see how a nail is used. A small nail on top of that, a seagrass is kept, and then you no know, kind of pegged inside so that doesn't uh, have any problem. And then you have, I see the mats here. Then you can see this is amazing. The one here, okay, this they have used some kind of uh, uh, substrate. You know, the, uh, some kind in the sense that it's kind of the gunny packet structure and that they have allowed to you know, grow these uh, seagrass and once they are completely grown in aquarium tanks, then they are transporting it to the uh, donor site or the site, not the donor site, the site where they want to de deploy it. This is very much in India. This is done in Gulf of Manar. This is the one work done by SDMRI, uh, to the private uh, organization that has done a lot of work in coral transplantation and uh, coral restoration, I mean seagrass restoration. Uh, you see here that uh, they are either using you know uh, quadrants they're putting permanent quadrants and the seagrass are tied on nylon ropes and they put down why a quadrant is kept because this is a research study and they can see how much within the quadrant uh, uh, the, the within the quadrant the seagrass have grown good density poor density medium density all can be calculated and they also use pigs like this you can see small j hooks these j hooks are again metal hooks which can be used to plug so that the, the entire uh, quadrant do not move about at the time of, uh, you know, when high water currents are there. Right, so this is uh, one of the studies which we are right now uh, working on. It's going to get published now. So what we've done is that, interestingly, uh, these are the, so far, dugongs that have been, you know, in many places. Is this, uh, either they are stranded or entangled in the uh, net and they release back or you know some of them are sighting it some have rescued it uh, rescue in the sense that they'll be caught but they'll release back and uh, we also seen that there is also some poaching incident so we, we try to get all the positions of them and try to map it okay i'm telling you the importance of map and the importance to know about the seagrass ecosystem i showed a seagrass map earlier okay so now what we're going to do we're going to compare this geolocation of all the sightings of the uh, the dugongs with a map, okay? And when we see, this is the exact location, okay? This is the place, and you can see this is the most thickest density is here, and what we see is that the high strandings or boat hits or entanglement happens in this place, because this is the boat route. So probably they have been feeding somewhere around here. So this gives a clue, and this gives the idea for environmental planners how to in integrate maps in the form of visual observations into the planning of any conservation work. So restoration is very important, but restore, you must know the entire locality, entire area, Taro. And this gives us a brilliant view about how this paper, we're just publishing it, and uh, we will be able to tell exactly how this can be going to planning, okay? And uh, the seagrass, again, what is another favorite seagrass of mine is Enhalus acoridus, very common one, the sea turtles and dugongs love it. Now, I told you we know the maps, okay? Now, how this will be employed, okay? Now, this again, uh, uh, project that we are doing for Niti Ayog, the Planning Commission, along with CMFRA and uh, CSMCRA, where, see, they want to cultivate seagrass, sea, uh, sea, uh, algae, for a lively activity. Okay, now, since we know the seagrass map, where the seagrass are, we can avoid this area. So it goes into very much in conservation planning. So we will not touch the seagrass area, because when you do a, a, a seabed culture very close to any sensitive system, automatically the people come, be boat anchored, so this will destroy the seagrass bed. So we avoid the dense seagrass bed. Of course, seagrass is everywhere, but these are, uh, you know, uh, we call them as, you know, plots or you not know, big areas. Uh, these areas are the places where we avoid, and that's how we do conservation planning. Right, so now I have just given you a very, very bird's eye view about the seagrass. One hour or 40 minutes is not sufficient for to you know to, for me to explain about the importance of seagrasses. But what I've tried to give you is a bird's eye view and you know, <clears throat> in a nutshell, that why they are to be restored. Okay, and if they are restoration planning, they play a very important role. Okay, for every conservation planning, earlier days it was just species conservation, but now it's ecosystem conservation. We take the ecosystem completely and then we plan and then we conserve, okay? And restoration plays a very important role in degraded areas, areas that are barren, so that what happens? One, there can be a lot of community participation because communities live close by to all the sensitive ecosystem and they are the users, the major users. They should be aware of what they have and to involve them is very important. We call them CBRN, community business management, everything available. And you can see that 